The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hi, I'm David. Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down toys, tools and appliances just to find out what's inside. Today we're going back vintage again, in electronics age anyway, uh, and we're going to be tearing down an old, not quite Pong console. I have to admit, it, admit, I've cheated a little bit on this one. I haven't actually looked up how old it is. I suspect we're probably going to find out by the, the, the age and the production number on some of the, the uh, integrated circuits on it. The original Pong game came out in the early 70s and it was completely TTL, which is transistor to transistor logic. So the entire game was basically coded by placing transistors and passive components together to make them generate a video output. Shortly afterwards, all of these passives were integrated onto a single circuit board and that became known as Pong on a chip. Now, obviously, as time went by, they got marginally more advanced and you end up with 10 games on a board. Let's get started. Now, I was very, very lucky to find one still boxed and still with the instructions even with genuine coffee stain on it. Um, I have to admit, I really like the troubleshooting and sort of the setup stages on this, but uh, these will give you an idea of how the games look. Yeah, I think realistic may have been a reach in the description, but uh, they were ever so slightly different games, even if they all appeared very, very similar. As you can see, everything's all permanently wired. There are no sockets. I imagine that's uh, a question of budget. Every plug is an extra component that needs to be installed and paid for. And these, uh, this nice little orange bit of plastic just screws on the end here, just to give you a nice little controller. And to be honest, they feel nice. They, they're definitely two discrete sort of ways of working. Uh, I, I'm interested to know how the controllers communicate with the board, whether it's actually just direct analog signal and there's probably uh, uh, just to see whether there's a big variable resistor in there which sends a signal back to the main board. First thing, I guess, is going to be turn this over and take out the masses of batteries. This thing runs on six C cells at nine volts, uh, which under normal circumstances does mean it costs a fortune to run. Again, this is a nice old electronic device which has actually got real screws on the bottom. Oh. Crusty screws, but screws nonetheless. Ah, very simple board. So yeah, <laughs> I'd, I'd kind of um, miss that. In the instructions, they actually give details that when you tune the telly and you have to turn the volume right down. I hadn't really appreciated that that meant none of the sound actually comes out of the telly. It all comes out of the speaker on board, which I guess makes the RF modulation a lot simpler. Again, I guess it's just driving down the cost a little bit more at a time. Otherwise, lots of passives. This chip down here, the AY38610, is, uh, will be the Pong on a chip device. And you see it's actually socketed, so we can actually remove that in a dip format. Uh, let's see if we can get it all out. That seems to have been just a single screw holding that on. Main board, and then underneath, we've got a second board, which is either ultrasonically or thermally welded to the keyboard. But it's going to push forward. Ah, there we go. Sort of half and half. There we go. Okay, well, this is actually made in house. It's, ooh, man, I thought some of my soldering was crusty. But yeah, there's definitely a kind of a patina of flux over the entire board. Uh, it kind of looks like it was wave soldered, but nobody ever cleaned it. Um, it's obviously not corrosive, otherwise, we'd just be left with a pile of dust. And uh, yeah, got what appears to be a bodge wire over there. Just really questionable soldering there. That's all ground plane, I think. So not the end of the world, but not exactly nice either. So I've just looked up the, uh, the part number of this AY38610 chip. Um, mine's got the manufacturer date of 1979 week 30. So that's what, July time in 1979. Uh, so yeah, it's about the right era, right age. Um, it's interesting that having looked up that part number, not only do you get a sort of plethora of different consoles, just like this one with varying degrees of sort of plastics and bits and pieces on the front, 
but there's also an image of this actually being used on a cartridge so this makes me think that this chip was very compatible and could be used on other consoles let's see if we can just ease that out of its socket i know i know i don't have a socket removing tool i'm sorry just remember to try and lift them up as evenly as possible and yeah, I think I got away with that. I didn't bend any pins, not noticeably. So there you go, that is Pong on a chip, or in this case, it's Pong and nine other games on a chip. Okay, well now we've seen in the main unit, I guess we should have a look inside the controller. As they're both physically wired in, of course, there's no need for addressing or uh, anything clever to identify which controller's which. They're wired, permanent, that's that forever. I'm should have looked on the other side of the main board. I'm kind of expecting there to be a common and then three signal wires. You've got a left right axis, which I suspect is gonna be analog, a right, uh, an up down channel, which is gonna be analog, and then the third button. So four core cable. Oh, okay. Just about the simplest joystick assembly you can get. Got a potentiometer for your up down, potentiometer for your left right. Nice little gimbal arrangement so that both the pots can be fixed but they still get the input so you've actually got four cores and ground because you've got a common which just uh zeros of potentiometers so they're equi equal potential but it's a really neat little assembly i'm sure that's been used lots for various types of um, device but yeah I, I, I think there's something really pleasing about that i know i said i wanted to get this back together but i'm kind of more interested to get it further apart than anything else okay Remove those little melted plastic or ultrasonically welded. Ah, oh, I thought these would be tack switches. They're not, they're sort of, um, well, they are tack switches, but they're tack switches without a, sort of a body to them. Um, you see the little domed bit of metal which sits on the outside trace on the PCB. Um, and that dome is just what you're deforming. I don't know if you can hear that. <laughs> to uh, make and break the contact. Now that is exactly what you would find inside a tack switch, but of course it's just built into a single package. Here you've got all the bare components laid out on a nice little board. And I wonder, I wonder if that XJ024A board is one that you could buy off the shelf at the time. It's a really kind of cute way of doing it. It's full size. For completeness, I feel like we should definitely take the left player apart as well. Okay, same again, plastic case, nice rocking body. Okay, same arrangement again, same standard board. Pleasing, I like that. Right, since we've gone ahead and basically destroyed the controllers, we may as well go in for it and have a look at the switches and the keyboard. Well, they describe it very optimistically as a keyboard. I'm not sure I would. Okay, well that's uh, <laughs> a lot of the buttons freed up, but not the switches yet. There we go. Oh, yeah, uh, okay. Right, I'm feeling quite vindicated for actually going ahead and just out and out destroying this now. Um, I've already sort of said that the tack switches are kind of not tack switches. I don't know whether they predate them. I can't imagine they do, but you've got sort of the bare internals of a tack switch and uh, no case, they're just sort of printed straight on the PCB and there's a single, single deformed piece of steel which as you press deforms and that gives you that tactile switch click. Now I suspected these switches were little single push switches, what I hadn't realised was they're exactly the same, there are traces on the PCBs for make and break in fact, you can see where they've rubbed on the board and sort of almost go over their own traces. They've rubbed through the mask and actually you can see the raw traces. And then, yeah, on the plastic side, which, as I said, it's not a piece of metal. That's just, well, maybe it is aluminium. Yeah, a little plastic riser with a piece of aluminium just crimped on it uh, with a single piece of copper on the back, which presses down on it. And the uh, sort of the detent is just these little plastic arms on the side. So, yeah, everything is really down to the bare minimum here. When all the transistor to transistor logic got integrated onto a single PCB, uh, onto a single uh, IC, uh, I guess it was kind of all about cost. There's, there's no sort of incentive to go for glorious consoles. Uh, it's not far 
different in age from when you start to get the first consoles. So yeah, it's, it's how cheap you can churn these out, how many homes can you get them into. And uh, this was around the first sort of computer console and home computing boom. So yeah, it's all about cost and mass production and get them in every home you can. Uh, this is number 113,872. So this unit on its own had a big, big production run, not to mention all the other variations with the same chip. And then you have previous versions and console, uh, cartridge consoles. There must have been so many of these and similar permutations about. I realized that for the electronics inside, this is a reasonably simple teardown. But for me, this is kind of a turning point in history where we went from TTL and all those discrete parts to a single integrated circuit package and just to imagine that this was one of the earliest ones uh, where you had that. Uh, you compare this to a modern CPU, GPU or APU with billions of 12 nanometer or smaller um, components on a single wafer and you have to think back that this is where it started. I've really enjoyed seeing inside this and uh, it's just a piece of electronics history. I hope you enjoyed it too. Um, if you've got any ideas for a teardown or something you'd like to see, let us know over at the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.